It's the 19th of February, 2021. Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Cush, executive editor of RoomNow.com. The RoomNow podcast is brought to you by RoomNow.live, where you can go and register a great meeting for great rheumatologists. Come, you'll change your mind, change your practice, could change your life. This week, we have a lot of information to cover. We last week did a review of the RWCS meeting. So I have a number of citations from the last two weeks included in this particular podcast. We'll start with interleukin-18. Interleukin-18, as you know, is another one of those pro-inflammatory cytokines um, made in the course of an innate immune response like IL-1. IL-18 is made uh, and is regulated by the IL-18 binding protein. But IL-18 is actually found in a lot of uh, auto-inflammatory syndromes in Stills disease. And in this particular report, very high levels of IL-18 were shown to be associated with the macrophage activation syndrome and its other counterpart with another name, both primary and secondary HLH or the hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis syndrome. Uh, It could be a biomarker of impending doom and cytokine storm. Uh, And if only it were commercially available, this would be a great advantage in managing patients who are febrile in the hospital who have either systemic JIA um, or a number of autoimmune or uh, infectious or malignant disorders. Uh, As you know, systemic JIA is one of the leading causes of MAS. But again, I I don't have a great biomarker. I think ferritin is a very good biomarker, especially when it's in the thousands. Um, Then you should consider that. But uh, ferritin plus dropping dropping cell counts, um, uh, a dropping ESR that was once high, um, a rising CRP. Um, I like aldolase levels as being very high in these, in, in these patients with normal CPKs. But again, if IL-18 were available, it might be a real advantage. Um, an interesting study comes from the journal Rheumatology, where Dennis McGonigal and colleagues uh, looked at a cohort uh, from an Italian inflammatory bowel disease clinic. They had 90 patients in that clinic who were taking the integrin inhibitor vetalizumab. As you know, it's actually quite good at the colitis, not so good at arthritis, but nonetheless, what they found in those 90 patients is an 8% incidence of uh, severe enthesitis. Um, In four of them, it was multifocal, six uh, unifocal, one it was um, associated with, uh, um, I think, dactylitis and periostitis. Uh, What they found was that the onset of enthesitis occurred Roughly after long-term therapy, at a mean of 46 weeks of therapy, they had an associated high CRP level, uh, and the majority when tested were B27 negative. Um, The enthesitis was confirmed by power Doppler, um, and and in half the patients who had power Doppler, uh, those entheses developed calcifications over time. Uh, the resolution was that if you stop the drug, those will go away. A lot of the patients, the enthesitis would pass with time, or half of them, it would pass with time. It's a new syndrome that can occur in your patients who have uh, enteritis and are taking uh, vetalizumab. The Journal of JAMA Pediatrics, or actually, excuse me, JAMA Dermatology, published an interesting review about the MISC syndrome. That's the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children with COVID. Uh, They talked about the mucocutaneous findings that are seen in their 35 patient cohort. And I think this is representative of what's been seen in other populations as well. Number one, conjunctival injection in, I think it was 21 of their 35 patients. Uh, Palmal plantar erythema in 18, lip hyperemia, 17, periorbital edema and or erythema, 7, strawberry tongue, 8, malar erythema, 6. Remember, this looks something like Kawasaki, so the lip swelling, the periorbital changes, the strawberry tongue, very reminiscent of Kawasaki's. Um, The age of their kids was a little younger than seen in other series where this particular syndrome is seen in older kids where most Kawasaki's are in younger kids. Uh, Nonetheless, I think those are clinical findings worth noting. An interesting study comes from the USTAR database, a large database collecting data on scleroderma patients. In this cohort of um, 144 patients, 
that had testing for the anti-PM SCL positive antibodies. So PM slash SCL antibodies um, that was associated with a certain subset of patients who are more likely to have muscle involvement, ILD, calcinosis, dermatomyositis, and in those who had muscle involvement, it tend to be more uh, 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 tend to be more severe in overall phenotype. Uh, again, is it worth ordering these tests in scleroderma patients? I don't. And I don't because I don't see how it's going to change my therapy, mainly because I don't see what's going to change my therapy other than lung disease. And I don't have enough therapies that are truly effective to make uh, such smarts work to my and the patient's advantage. So I'm largely stuck doing ANAs and I'm done. I don't really do much further testing. You, sometimes SCL70, sometimes you get back an antisentromere, but I don't do those testing. Maybe you do. Maybe you should convince me why you would do them. Another interesting study on scleroderma comes from uh, Annals Rheumatic Disease where the Johns Hopkins group uh, and the group at UCS, UCSF uh, in California looked at their scleroderma patients and tested for antibodies against um, uh, telomerase and shelterin. Uh, the TERF-1 uh, uh, antibodies. Uh, while these are rare in other diseases like RA and myositis and controls, these TERF-1 antibodies against uh, t uh, telomeres um, was seen in 9% of patients with systemic sclerosis and was associated with more severe lung disease, an odds ratio of 2.4 and shorter telomere sh uh, length overall on other testing that they did. The bottom line was is that this might be another biomarker that could tell you those who are gonna have more severe lung disease, but again, unless it was given to me, would you do it? So at RWCS last week, um, a UCSF gastroenterologist, Dr. Uma Mahadevan, presented the results of her 14 years of effort and work on something called the piano registry. I've probably talked about that in the, in the past. Pardon me if I'm gonna talk about it again. I just think it's the world's greatest study. It's 1,431 patients with inflammatory bowel disease followed prospectively by I think 30 um, GI centers around the country. This was an investigator initiated protocol that's been going on for 13 years where they prospectively collected data on pregnancy outcomes in over 1,400 patients who went on to re either receive no therapy or thiopurine, 6-MP and azathioprine, or a TNF inhibitor, or a combination of thiopurine and a TNF inhibitor. So four treatment groups, and they found no difference in fetal outcomes between the treatment groups, meaning that there's no higher rate of um, congenital malformations when more aggressive therapies are used, including thiopurines or TNF inhibitors or both. They did have, I think, a slight increase in um, um, spontaneous abortions, um, but it was really important to note that this was a very well done study. They looked at a lot of things. Uh, you may want to actually look at this lecture on the RWCS website where she goes over the many facets of the study, including what happens with you know, breastfeeding, what happens with the children after delivery. Again, all good news, all benign um, or no significant outcomes. Uh, a nice uh, report appeared um, as a heads up from Reuters um, in the news, which was a study of uh, from Israel that looked at what happened to patients who were vaccinated. Uh, and what they said was that if you were vaccinated, received the two vaccines against COVID-19, you were overall less contagious. So among 650,000 people who received two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, later on, almost 3,000 of them, 3,000 out of 650,000, tested positive for COVID-19, but their nasal swab samples showed fourfold less virus. So becoming positive later on was very infrequent. Having enough of a viral load to be clinically significant was very unlikely. The point being that vaccination really can protect against further contagiousness. Um, I think we should... Um, uh, congratulate the ACR task force led by Jeff Curtis and colleagues who last week published guidelines about the use of the COVID vaccines in patients with autoimmune and rheumatic diseases. 
I think that you should read that. I think you should look at the ACR um, website. Actually, I'll put the link up where you can actually look at the town hall that they had this past week on Tuesday, where they describe their findings and discuss some of their recommendations. I think the recommendations are, in fact, controversial. What they did have right and that everyone universally agrees with is that patients on most biologics and most DMARDs should not stop those biologic DMARDs when they get the vaccine. The real issues surround one, methotrexate, two, rituximab, three, JAK inhibitors, and four, abatacept. So I wrote down this week that, in fact, um, I, I well, I agree with not changing most DMARs and biologics. I disagree with um, holding Orencia for both the first and second um, uh, in, in vaccination. I don't get it. They also make the same suggestion for holding a JAK inhibitor. I don't think there's any evidence to really recommend that. And I also disagree with holding methotrexate for both doses of the of the um, vaccination and only holding it for one week. Again, the recommendation on methotrexate is holding it for two weeks after the influenza vaccine. That's been well studied. These have not been well studied. These are all expert opinion. But again, I think there's going to be a lot of discussion on this in the weeks to come. An interesting study uh, from the journal Lupus concerns patients with both cutaneous lupus and systemic lupus coming from over 5,000 patients in a Danish lupus cohort study. What they And over a period of it looks like almost 20 years with about eight years of follow-up and 40,000 patient years of uh, exposure or experience, they showed lupus patients have an overall increased risk of certain cancers. That applies to cutaneous lupus erythematosus, where the SIR was 1.35, and in systemic lupus, where the SIR was 1.45. As you know, the SIR is a standardized incidence ratio, the same as a relative risk, if you will, for cancer. So they found a three, four, a three to four-fold increased risk in these patients for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, certain hematologic malignancies, pancreatic cancer, and lung cancer. Um, a bit of sobering news for our patients with lupus. Jay Room published, I think, a very interesting study that we've also talked about in the past, but now it's published. It's the mirror study. It's the use of methotrexate in patients going on IV peglodicase for difficult refractory gout. In their study, they had 17 patients who were receiving IV peglodicase in the usual manner, and they were also put on methotrexate a month before starting IV peglodicase, and they continued it throughout the therapy. They were also on folic acid. Um, these patients had severe disease with hyperuricemia. I think the majority of them had TOFI. And what they showed was 11 out of the 14 or 79% were responders at six months, meaning their uric acid had normalized to less than six. Um, and that was their goal of this study. Again, again, no appreciable increase in toxicity. The three that did not respond were three that dropped out because their uric acid was rising, and that was a rule for discontinuation of, of the, uh, from the protocol uh, and discontinuation, as you know, for IV peglodicase. Uh, theoretically, the use of methotrexate is supposed to uh, prevent these anti-peg antibodies, which then give rise to the rising uric acid. Um, so it didn't work in three patients, but in all the other ones, they were responders. And that's a higher response rate than what was seen in the clinical trials, where the, generally the response rate was about 40%. The last report is a report, a nice review report on cancer pro, uh, uh, testing or cancer screening in patients with inflammatory myositis. They looked at a large number of patients and a large number of, of clinical trials, and they showed that the um, factors that were associated with an increased risk for cancer included one, dermatomyositis, 2.2% increased relative risk. Older age, being male, dysphagia, cutaneous ulcerations, and having anti-TIF1 gamma antibodies, which gave you a relative risk of almost five. Um, any combination of those might be a good enough reason to do further screening for a cancer. Turns out there were other clinical features and phenotypes that were associated with a lower risk of cancer, and that included patients just with a diagnosis of polymyositis, a 50% reduced risk, uh, amyopathic uh, dermatomyositis called CADM, or um, dermatomyositis, cinemyositis, clinically amyopathic dermatomyositis, um, uh, Raynaud's phenomenon, interstitial lung disease, a very high uh, serum creatinine, ki uh, cre creatine kinase, uh, 
uh, very high LDH levels and the presence of the anti-synthetase antibodies, anti-JO1 or anti-EJ, was associated with a much lower risk of cancer in these patients with inflammatory myositis. That's it for this week on the podcast. Tune in next week for more cool news about, you guessed it, roomnow.live. Register now for online or attending on site. We'll see you in Fort Worth.